First is sponsored by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Things First. I'm Jenna Wolf, alongside Nick Wright, Kevin Wilds, some very happy Eric Mangini <laughs> with us this morning. It is Friday, finally, and we have a great show for you today. Coming up, Dak and the Cowboys are once again at an impasse. So where do we go from here? We'll let you know. Uh, what would it look like if Brady and LeBron teamed up together? What if LeBron and Brady teamed up together? We'll talk about that. And Hollywood Brown is going to join us, talk about the upcoming season with Lamar Jackson. Nick's already shaking his head. He loves my joke so much. We'll start this morning, though, with the possible death of the onside kick in the NFL. Here we go. NFL owners are voting on a unique rule change that would pivot to an alternative. So teams would be allowed a fourth and 15 from their own 25 instead of the usually unsuccessful and oftentimes dangerous onside kick. Advantage, high-powered offenses. Nick, kick things off with you. What do you think? Ooh, kick All right, off. just to be clear, Jenna, I was not shaking my head at your joke. Your joke was wonderful. I was, a, I was concerned about LeBron starting to hang out with a you know, an untoward element, if you will, given Tom Brady's friend group. But we'll get to that later in the show. To start with sure. this right now, to kick off talking about the potential death of the onside kick, this would be an amazing, historic change for the NFL. This would be a major, major departure from how things have always been done. I think it would be a welcome change. One thing Coach and I have talked about off the air a lot as far as I know people laugh when I say this, but Coach and I talk about football strategy a lot, especially when we're able to be in the same room and not quarantined, is that you must avoid getting yourself in what we call an onside kick game, where because of time score situation, the only way you can get back in the game is by successfully recovering an onside kick. And that was the belief before the NFL changed the rules and made onside kicks almost impossible to recover. Think back to the most famous comeback, arguably, in NFL history, Falcons, Patriots, in the Super Bowl. One of the reasons that many of us feel like the Falcons butchered that so badly was they had many opportunities to force the Patriots into an onside kick game, and their play calling went the other way to where the Patriots could just essentially run their normal offense and not have to get into an onside kick game. If you remove the onside kick entirely, the butterfly effects are enormous, Wilds. If you're watching the game and your team has the ball with six minutes left, down 17, you're thinking, well, we probably won't win, but we score here, get the conversion, we could score again, convert it again, because you would be allowed to do this twice, and we could win the game without our defense ever having to take the field. Wilds, I also wonder... People say it'll be good for high-powered offenses. I wonder if it could be used against high-powered offenses. Say you're playing my Kansas City Chiefs, I, I, and you're down seven no with boy. four minutes left, and you score a touchdown, right? You score a touchdown to tie the game. Would you consider going for it, saying, well, if we get it, we'll keep the ball, and if we don't get it, they'll, they'll have such a short field, at least we'll get the ball back. I think there will be a lot of potential ripple effects from this. I love the idea of it, Wilds. I don't know why anyone would vote against it. Uh, I'll go a, even a crazy step further that we'll eventually see. Uh-oh, we're playing the Chiefs. We're probably going to lose. Let's try to keep them literally off the field. You could theoretically score two-point conversion, fourth and 15, again and again. You could... Not you could keep the offense off the field until it's 24 nothing theoretically. And coach, I want to give some numbers to you. If I saw this rule and I worked at the Sloan Sports Conference, I would start cranking them right now. But just for some stats, and I'm gonna pull a Kornheiser here. Put my glasses on. <laughs> Fourth and 15 last year, 28.6 percent. Small sample size, two for seven. Previous year, three for seven, 43 percent. Then they go 0 for 0 and 0 for six. 2016, two for six, 33%. Compare that to onside kick success, which in the last five seasons, about 13%. So it feels like fourth and 15 is much more advantageous, would happen much more often. As a coach, how would you plan for this? 
Well, there, there's a couple things here. So the NFL does have the benefit of seeing how this worked with the XFL. This will probably be the legacy of the XFL if it gets passed. And I understand the player safety component of this as well. But as you guys talk about keeping the Chiefs off the field, and, and look, let's not put the Chiefs in, in the, you know, unstoppable offense category for years and years to come. Like, I get it. They they were they played really well this year, but we're, 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 we're fast-forwarding a little too much here. But we'll, we'll get back to that, too. But if you wanted to keep a team off the field, typically a surprise onside kick hits a lot at a much higher rate than an onside kick that people know okay. is coming. So you would actually have an edge on a surprise onside kick if you're trying to keep a team off the field than you would – you know, a fourth and 15 or a regular onside kick. Here's what I don't like about it. Football is a, is a uh, effect of all three phases of the game. And this, again, takes something away from special teams. And it, it, it to me, to have to be able to perform in all three phases of the game is, is as important to the uh, integrity of the game as, as anything. Do I think this is a, the way it's going? Yeah. Do I love it? No. Hmm. All right. Well, Nick is right. It can also help defenses. But for the most part, if you just look at this on its surface, this is a proposed rule that would benefit oh, yeah. the high-powered offense. And we're not talking the Chiefs down the road. We're talking the Chiefs next year. They are a very high-powered offense. In fact, nobody happier about this than Patrick Mahomes tweeting fourth and 15 with a pair of cold sweat emojis, putting the league on notice. Nick, how much do you think this would actually affect the Kansas City Chiefs? First of all, Jenna Wolf uh, elucidating what, to me, what that emoji means. No sarcasm here. I've never known that was a cold sweat emoji. I've always wondered, why is the guy's head? I thought it's That makes total sense. Great job by you, Jenna. I had no idea. I now understand what that emoji means. I'm, I, Anytime I, I can help you sarcastic. get smarter, Nick, I swear to God, <laughs> I didn't know that was a cold sweat emoji. All right. Now, I understand Coach thinks we're fast-forwarding too much with the Chiefs and the offense. Can we hit rewind instead? How about the year before they won the Super Bowl when they were the third highest scoring offense in the history of football and Patrick Mahomes had 5,000 yards, 50 touchdowns? I mean, it just kind of does seem like they're, you know, one of the all-time greatest offenses with one of the all-time greatest quarterbacks, but what do I know? The reason Patrick Mahomes is so excited about this is because last year, 16 times he dropped back to pass on 3rd and 15 or 4th and 15 or longer. He was 12 of 16 with three touchdowns on a 156.3 passer rating. In other words, Patrick Mahomes is better at third or fourth and super long than any other quarterback in the league is at anything. So that's why he's excited about this. But I do think this could be used against the Chiefs defense to try to keep the Chiefs offense off the field, Wilds. And so I don't think there is just it is necessarily only great for the offenses, but I do think that it obviously, to Coach's point, and I understand we talk about head coach Eric Mangini, but prior to being head coach Eric Mangini, he was defensive coordinator Eric Mangini, and I understand why defensive coordinators, and I'll kick it to you, Coach, would see this and say another thing where you are tilting the scales in favor of the offenses, I love it, but I understand why on the defensive side of the ball it might seem like you're further weighing the scales. I don't know if it, it's totally slanting it towards the offense. Fourth and 15 is not an easy conversion, and it shouldn't be an easy conversion. And the numbers re reflect that. Now, Kansas City had an abnormally high success rate in, in, in that situation. And, and as people go and, and, and vote for this proposal, hopefully they're voting for it based on safety, first and foremost, and then based on, on you know, how much they think it'll add to the excitement of the game. I do think it takes away from from the idea of all three phases having to work together. Does it does it skew offensively? Yeah, it does in the sense that typically if an offense has gone down and scored, they've got momentum and the, the defense is, is reeling to some degree. So then they have to come back out and, and make another stop. It does put you in, in a difficult position. That being said, it's not an easy conversion to, to complete. So... I see both sides of it. 
Wilds, just quickly before we go, a few points and then something I know you're going to like. One is that when we talk butterfly effects, this will lead to, I see into a crystal ball, this will lead to me coming into work on a Monday morning, having a team that was four-point favorites and had a nine-point lead with two and a half minutes left, and I've lost the bet. This will lead to some historical gambling losses by me and others out there. And this will totally change the Madden game forever. Because on Madden, everyone's going to do this every time. But when we're talking about the defending champion Kansas City Chiefs Wilds, a a quick list, five things the NF that has happened this offseason that has made it easier for the Chiefs to become a dynasty. And I'd love to see your reaction to this. How about this? Number five. No one traded for the Chiefs' best defensive player, Chris Jones. Number four, no one in the AFC West signed Cam Newton. Well, we've got Drew Locke, Tyrod Taylor, and Derek Carr. Who needs Cam Newton? Number three, the Chiefs' offense had their pick of the litter of all the running backs coming out of college because no one drafted a running back before them. Number two, Eric Bieniemy still there. And now number one, you'd give Another rule to the offense with one of the greatest offenses ever. I would come up with a list of five ways things got harder for your beloved Patriots. But to be fair, it would have to be about a 50-point list, and we don't have the font for that, Wilds. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I was, I was praying that Jerry.